What's up guys and welcome back to Moaning. If you guys are new here, then what's up? My name's Erica. Hey ya, how you doing? For today's video, even though you guys can see this book that is right next to me, it's actually not gonna be a book review. Though the intended video was to upload a book review of A Gorgon's Price with my lovely guest today, we ended up having a much more interesting conversation, which is actually going to be the video that you guys watch. Now, to ruin it for you guys, <laughs> that we only spoke about the book for about 15 minutes of our Zoom call, and we both agreed that A Gorgon's Price is not one that we would recommend. Neither of us really liked it. And so for those reasons, I'm not gonna be putting any of the links in the description below because I know you guys trust me. And apparently I woke up today and chose violence in saying that I do not recommend this book and I didn't enjoy it. So instead, the conversation I'm gonna share with you guys is with my lovely guest who is Mary Lou. Now she runs the very popular bookstagram account that is called I Am The Library Book Dragon you guys can find that linked in the description below. But she's also a folklorist, which made sense when we were going to be reviewing this book because there's lots of different world mythologies that were uh, included, fairy tales that were included in this book that were played upon. So I thought that she would be the perfect person to come on and to talk about this with. However, <laughs> instead we ended up just chatting about mythology in general because Mary Lou is very well versed in Greek mythology even though she can't read the um, ancient Greek language, which is fine. That's, you know, my job as a classicist. And instead, what we ended up talking about was myth in general and the reception of myth. And something I think is really important that we, we really highlighted throughout this conversation is how the different perspectives of mythology, like when people read it, when you at home read the books and you take something from a story or something resonates with you or something doesn't, you know, maybe you've missed something. All of that is just as important as the myth retellings that are going on and how you guys interpret the story in different ways is such a vital and valuable part of, you know, retellings, right? Retellings in general and talking about mythologies. And there is no one way of viewing these stories. And in fact, throughout this conversation, Mary Lou and I disagreed a lot, right? There are a number of things when we were talking about characters like Circe and Calypso, even Medusa, Perseus, Jason, Medea. I mean, we mentioned so many famous characters from myth and we disagreed on a lot of them, but we did so respectfully. And that's something that I really want to show you guys because I think it's always important to be uploading conversations where disagreements do happen, but they're done in a kind and respectful uh, way. So I'm really, really excited to show you guys this conversation, to share this with you. And I would encourage you guys as you listen, or maybe if you guys are just watching this on YouTube, because I know a bunch of you just listen to these videos rather than watch them. So if you guys happen to be uh, engaging with this content in any way, I would encourage you guys to also go down to the comments and let us know what you think as you watch or as you listen. You know, are there certain characters that resonated a certain way with you? Have you always read something one way and then someone told you not to and that changed the way that you viewed the character? You know, just let us know because I do think this is a very important topic and I'm absolutely thrilled to give you guys this conversation. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I just enjoyed having it. You know, look, I'm, I'm assuming that there are people who know about the about the story of Medusa. I'm assuming, and just in case no one does or they have a basic knowledge, which I'll probably be a little basic here because there's so much to cover. There's different variations and whatnot. So uh, basically, Medusa what is a Gorgon. She is the only mortal sister of... I'm blanking out on how to pronounce the other sister's name. Benno. This Benno. is why I need her. And what happens is that, again, based on the variation that you read, I know of two variations. Poseidon and Medusa were in a were found in Athena's temple, but the one that is more like highly, I wouldn't say favored, but people focus on this more, and for good reason why, it is that she was essayed however Athena punishes Medusa by turning her into this hideous creature and what happened was that Perseus kills Medusa to save 
his mother from this very you know creepy and silly king <laughs> in modern my modern take of the king <laughs> of course and 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 so on and so forth and it makes sense why the story of medusa is so well known i think that it's she's an important figure for many people who have been victims of of this trauma and there's reasons why people have the tattoo for example or that they have these retellings and reimaginings and i think it's wonderful however uh and this is actually why we finally are having a conversation is because I, w- I don't remember when, but I uh, DM'd Stevie. I shared her for real of of people doing this whole, like actually Athena was helping Medusa. And I remember ranting to her and saying like, you, you know, I, I think I even said like, look, I'm not trying to gatekeep here. Mythology evolves, interpretations evolve. I get that. But if you know the background of, of, if if you know the background of ancient Greek mythology, if you know what shape shifting is and the significance, the significance of snakes and so on and so forth, you will know that this is a curse. This is not helping. <laughs> there are plenty of stories, include if we just focus on Greek mythology, absolutely. I mean, there's a ton of other obviously pantheons, but if you focus on Greek mythology alone. It's very, it's of utmost importance to understand the difference between being favored and then being hated. Athena hated her. Well, I think that goes into a huge conversation of, which again, as you said, and this is always a good thing, is that people read myths and they see either themselves or they see a modern issue. Like I think that that is, obviously I wouldn't do book reviews on this channel if I didn't think that was a good thing. And I do wanna make that very clear because that's what keeps mythology in these stories alive, which is so fun. And even like, you know, Disney adapting, even like the Grim Tales, right? Even something as simple as that, like the reinterpretation is so lovely. Even though if we look at things like The Little Mermaid, like that original story is, horrible and dark and tragic and yet Disney made it this beautiful little cartoon and now Halle Bailey did such a good job with you know the live action so the way it adapts and the way it changes is important but the issue is that sometimes there is a way of reading into something where that doesn't exist necessarily and I think that's the main problem so it you know what you're saying about Medusa and Athena. Athena is not a goddess that really likes women. She has a massive issue with many women in in mythology, but obviously most famously Medusa. And so this isn't a case of, you know, women looking out for women. That's a very modern idea that we have now started saying should be the standard. It's like, hey, women support women, you know, all of this. That didn't exist then. Like Athena is not somebody who's going, yay, Medusa, like I'll protect you. No, as you said, it's it's a curse and we need to read it that way. And that's okay. Yeah, exactly. Because it's like, it op- it is a conversation of how rape culture has always been around, which is quite devastating and unfortunate. It's still prevalent, which is absolutely, again, abhorrent. But it's also showcases that there are, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the whole idea of women supporting women, which I'm really into, but it's I, it's not exactly true in many cases. Sometimes the worst trauma is when a woman enables it, you know, and Athena is an enabler, but also in many ways an aggressor. I th- I would consider her the force transformation of Medusa to be an assault. And I feel that people don't really see that. They see it as, oh, they would make excuses like, oh, well, she was in the temple, but it's like Poseidon is a god. Medusa can't say no. In those periods and, and in many other cultures too with uh, with their own mythologies and whatnot, to say no to the Olympians is practically a death sentence you don't say no you don't say no to them you don't say no to near immortals too at the end of the day medusa suffered 
and it's just horrific and that's why uh as you like i th- i think what you said that beautifully it's true it's like it's amazing to see how mythology fries and there's a growing new interest and so on but i think it's very important to know exactly what you're talking about because there are honestly better figures and stories that have what you're looking for i'm not saying that it, you can't see here i mean write about how the sisters loved each other like you in the myth itself screamed in anguish she's known for her howls she her howls chased after perseus when she when he flew away i mean i, I would have been more interested in seeing like how much the gorgons loved each other versus athena to be honest i think that is such an important point though of what you were saying how there are things that people are looking for in stories but they're almost injecting it into stories that don't have them and I find this a lot, and this is going to be quite a controversial thing to say, but I'm going to say it anyways, that people do that with women's stories from mythology. And I think Medusa is a good example of we want this to be a female empowerment story. It's not. Like, it's it's a horrible story. It's supposed to be a horrible story. But that doesn't mean that there aren't wonderful examples of female empowerment in Greek mythology within, obviously, the confines of the society. Like, that's obviously a very important thing. But if you look to the Amazon warriors... They're a race full of female warriors that didn't need any men. Literally, they just used them to have babies. And that was it. Like, <laughs> Okay, but whatever. But, you know, it's... But the the idea that they're there, you know, that it's like men who told these stories, presumably, we don't know who wrote those original stories because we don't have them, could have been a woman. You know, we have people like Sappho that show us, you know, well, women are, were doing things like that. So it's possible. There are lots of really good arguments for... Homer possibly being influenced by a woman because of all of the strong female characters in Homer. You know, so that's a really big thing, I think, is that when I see people who are looking at myths where I'm like, that idea of empowerment doesn't exist here and that's okay. Like, because there is a myth somewhere else that has exactly what you're looking for, engage there. I absolutely agree. I think, and and yeah, no, I think that people need to remember that it's okay to have these stories life sometimes sucks <laughs> life sometimes is tragic it's unfair and so on but if we keep trying to transform these stories you're in a sense censoring them you know so i think it that's why i think it's very important as a folklorist to keep to know what you're talking about to keep researching to keep reading and i'm happy to always give recommendations but yeah no I agree like there's plenty of strong female characters I mean and in a sense like like yeah like I women were saved in this story Perseus's mom who I can't remember her name right now and uh Andromeda no wait was it Andromeda yes okay yes (laughs) thank you I was like what was her name again she was saved like yeah sure it was she but there's nothing I I know that there's some people like oh but I want a woman saving themselves and so on and so forth but it's like it's okay to have that yeah that's not this story exactly and 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 you know and i think some people i i there was a statue i don't remember who who did this but there's a statue i could send it if you want to like insert it oh yeah you're like shaking your head uh you know what i'm talking about it's with medusa holding the decapitated head of perseus and i'm like i get what you what you're trying to say he he does kill her but the thing is like he it wasn't I hate to say it, it wasn't personal in a sense that he was like you know like she has to die it's like I have to save my mother because she was being harassed by this king and and again going back to how this is a curse when someone is shape for shape shift transformed sorry transformed is the correct term you're going to die eventually and Athena wanted it was a long con for Athena Athena wanted her dead eventually she just wanted her to suffer it was psychological torture and I think people don't realize that and and it's just and it's a shame because uh Perseus in a way is also a victim of the gods because it's like he had no choice either let his mom get on you know like whatever continue being harassed or and not to of course harassment is awful it's you know but not to compare but like and 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 a possible worse fate 
or the gods are going to like you're you're like we're not going to favor you we're going to hate you so it's like perseus himself i he had no choice yeah, you know what, let's let's focus on that statue for a second because I haven't really spoken about this and a lot of people have asked me about this statue and I do want to start off by agreeing with you that it is important to highlight where the artist was coming from and what the message of that statue is because I completely understand that, but the idea of victim blaming, the idea of taking back someone's power, like that is a very, very powerful statement but it's a statue that has bothered me since I've seen it because I'm like, as you said, Perseus was, he has a whole other mission. He's doing this for his mum, and no one wants to acknowledge that. But I'm like, Perseus is my dopey favorite hero. I do think he's dopey. He can't do anything by himself. Like, I think the perfect book that demonstrates this is Natalie Haynes' Stone Blind, that she really paints him as just- Amazing, read. Phenomenal, and, and she really gets to the bottom of like, he really can't do this alone. Like he can't even fathom the idea of doing this. If the gods didn't hand him everything and give him a fucking map and say, this is where you're going, he couldn't have done it. Like he just couldn't have. And I don't like that what that statue has done because it's playing off of the other statue of Persis like holding Medusa's head, which again, I acknowledged where the artist was coming from. But now that statue has made a whole generation of people talk about Perseus as the perpetrator. And I'm like, no. It was Athena and Poseidon, maybe, depending on what myth you read. 100% Poseidon's fault, but it is Athena's fault for the punishment. And I th I think it's, it's that a lot of people, and I think there's such a toxic trait that comes from being on the internet for such a long period of time, that people do not want to blame the woman in the story when it is Athena's fault. Like when you read that myth, there is no two ways about it. Poseidon did this horrible thing, but then he left and Athena said, fuck you Medusa, this is your punishment. And that's why the rest of the story happens. And she then goes to help Perseus. It is her fault. Yeah, she did it on purpose. That's why I was like, she like she planned this. She wanted her dead. There's no, there's no reason. I think that, as you mentioned, there is this stigma of like you can never like women can't be perpetrators or predatory which is not true and and when and there's proof from these stories and i get it like some people are are saying like oh but these are just stories but no for many people these have history in them and it's a way again to ex to explain things to, ex to express like why is it why are there different seasons what is time but also about human behavior so this is evident of like how again as i mentioned that women can be perpetrators abusers enablers you know and and the like and and they can be just as devastating you know and it's a very rare uh thing to talk about like we don't talk about this enough we don't talk about like how they're like uh you know i don't want to get into it because it's it's triggering but like I have instances where something has crossed the line by a woman and no one believed me or they would say like oh well you're being homophobic and it's like has nothing to do with being homophobic it like this I was uncomfortable. I couldn't agree I, I could not agree with this more like honestly and I think that the way that people are drawing that out of these myths a lot of these characters who I think have like not just Medusa, not just this myth, I think it goes to a lot of other myths as well that involve women. We have such incredible characters, such incredible female characters. A lot of them are actually insane. Like Medea is the perfect example. I love her. I think she has some of the best speeches in all of Greek mythology. I think she's got a fantastic story. She's insane. Like before Jason does anything to her, and I wanna make that clear to everybody, she still chops up her brother and goes, no problem, I'll just scatter him in the sea so that my dad has to stop. Like, but we don't talk about that side of Medea. We just pinpoint that, oh, well, Medea, because Jason was a dick. He was, but she was crazy long before this. <laughs> and it's, and, and, and that, oh, this is why I enjoy these types of conversations because, you know, like there are villain, like, uh, characters that I enjoy reading about because I'm fascinated, but 
I support them. I, I, I mentioned this to you before. I think Cersei is fascinating. I think she's she's powerful, you know? And I find it incredible that people are like, oh, well, Odysseus is a flanderer. He cheated on Penelope. Penelope is this weak woman, which is not the truth. That's another story I want to talk about for another day, but which is I completely disagree with. I think she has a quiet power. She is a trickster like figure if she's not a trickster but like with Odysseus it's like again going back like in that period you don't deny near immortals Circe is a near immortal she's the a daughter of a of a god uh, or, or no titan sorry my apologies but she is basically immortal she's an enchantress she knew potions I'm sorry you're telling me that she just suddenly I'm like I'm a good good person now no Circe is not someone I would trust. I'm not saying, uh, I think Amalyn Miller is fantastic, fantastic writer, incredible. Love both Circe and the Song of Achilles. Incredible writer. I could tell she respects the materials. I can tell she understands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we differ in opinion. Like she has a more sympathetic viewpoint of Circe, which is fine. That's valid. But trauma does not condone causing trauma. If you have read Homer's The Odyssey, what she says, what she does is a very, it's evil. You know, I'm not saying you can't like her or anything like that, but she is someone that she's, uh, in my opinion, she coerces Odysseus to have sex with her. I would actually disagree about Cersei. I don't hold those views about Cersei. I think that Cersei is much more of a, she is much more of a victim in mythology when you read her wider mythology and try and piece all of that together. And I think Madeline Miller hit her perfectly. Like in that book, I really felt like we got so much depth there. Um, so I don't necessarily agree with that, which is fine. Like I'm sure there are people who are watching who agree with you and people who are watching who agree with me and think, nah, Cersei, like I think I agree with you in the sense that she's a goddess. So if she were to have suggested this to Odysseus, he couldn't have said no. However, he acted in such a way that then when she ended up trying to protect herself, that was the solution. And he was told by Hermes that this thing would happen. And Hermes also told Circe that this is how this is gonna go. So to me, I've always said Hermes was the guy that orchestrated this whole thing. And Circe was again, kind of a victim in that situation. However, the goddess that I think all of those points really do apply to is Calypso. I think that Calypso from book five is a problem. And I've spoken to- Oh, she's problematic. I've spoken to Liv from, let's talk about Miss Baby. We had a whole little section about Calypso. Um, we just totally like fangirled about the Odyssey and the Iliad, and it was such a wholesome episode. You guys should watch that if you haven't already. It was really like just two friends who chatted over four hours and I pieced it together and just <laughs> hoped it made sense. It's really good. No, no, I love that conversation. But so we spoke about Calypso and even Liv was highlighting like, she has one great speech. She has a fantastic speech about the double standards of Greek gods and Greek goddesses, which is amazing and should be amplified. We should listen to her. But <laughs> we still have all of these notes throughout that book that Odysseus doesn't want to be there anymore, that he wants to go home. He's crying on the beach. He hasn't wanted to be there for years. Like he's been looking for a way out, but he has no ships. He's not allowed to build anything. And people always say to me like, oh, but Odysseus still sleeps with her. He is an unwilling lover to a willing lover. And in that instance, like you said, he, she's a goddess. He cannot say no. So what was he supposed to do? Just lay on the beach and wither away until he dies or wait until Calypso killed him? Like that's an instance where I think that's the perfect example of a female goddess who really was overstepping and was really just acting horribly. And the man is not given enough sympathy in that instance absolutely i absolutely agree with that assessment when i read that the first time i read that scene many years ago i was like i remember feeling very bothered by it and I'm, i was trying to to express this to other people and they're like oh like he went to her bed i'm like oh and i'm like okay i guess but it, it bothered me for a long time and i was just it, it wasn't until and it's a shame because we don't recognize the uh men being men and boys being victims of 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 essay e either especially regardless of gender but especially by women and it's just it's really heartbreaking 
but um no i absolutely agree with you and i don't care that there's a difference i think that's the whole point it's so amazing to have these discourse like i personally see it and i think it's because um and going to the wise one uh to 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 say like absolutely hermes is a he you know he i love him he's one of my favorite gods but he's a dick but for me it's just it's not uncommon for again as you know for immortal beings or near immortal beings to help out you see it in not just in ancient greek mythology you see it in various fairy tales french german and whatnot that this happens and so for me i see it as like the breaking of the wand is necessary because she was turning men into pigs and you know she and I think she was also camelizing people. Yeah, I've never heard that. <laughs> I've <laughs> turning men into pigs. They're still men. You know, she was probably cooking them. I'm sorry. That's how I feel. This is this is taking things from the text and we are now sort of having our own fictions about this. I do want to make that clear, guys. <laughs> Head canning, retelling the story. Don't worry, don't listen to to that part but like but uh you know so for me i think it was just like no it was necessary she was turning men into pigs and and it's one thing if and i and you know uh self-defense is one thing but these at least what we see the odysseus is Odysseus and his men came in, they're looking for shelter, food, they they arrive on the island, they're trying to replenish and she comes in and she's just she is, though, alone on the island. She has been mistreated, which is part of her real mythology. So she's been treated, mistreated a number of times. And I think that her having her guard up, for me, again, reading that made sense to me. That it's like, of, like I would react the same way. like Because there are laws of hospitality, which is the whole point of the Odyssey, obviously. Um, and Circe does allow men to come in and then she protects herself. So it is a very interesting episode when looking at the laws of hospitality. But I think looking into her character, I'm like, I mean, fair enough. If you're alone on an island, you know, no one is coming to help you. And if this guy decides to overpower you, if this guy and his men decide to do God knows what, and she doesn't have the power of an Olympian, she has the same thing that Medea has. Like she just has... Her potions if she can't get to them quickly enough if she can't do any of those things she is powerless among them and that i think was for me the main thing that i've, I've always read that and gone yeah same <laughs> no i definitely uh, uh, i i sleep with a bat so i totally understand that i absolutely i think what i think we can continue i don't uh we can always uh uh, of course, like, I love hearing these points of view. And again, like, I do understand that as well. But um, however, uh, not to bring this up, but like, I think when you have this perspective in mind, where it's like, I'm in danger, I'm in danger, you have the potential to hurt or even kill people who are innocent. And in this case, like, they didn't do anything. They're They're here. Like, I'm not saying that she shouldn't like when something arrives, she shouldn't protect herself. I'm not saying she shouldn't be wary either. I again, like I, I would be worried too, especially if I'm home alone and you know someone I don't know is in the house and I'm like, what what's going on? Like, trust me, I have my dog. He's vicious. I have my bat. I'm ready. But I I think with her, she uh, it was premature. For me, I just feel the sense of uh, I hate to bring this up, but like in America, how you know, like, uh, there's shootings uh, against people of color, mostly men of color, but I, uh, women of color and non binary and so on. And often the excuses is like, I felt scared of this person. So for me, I look, I, I can't help but compare the two a bit and be like, you know, like, I get being scared, I get feeling intimidated, but you should be careful, you should be wary, but I can't help but still feel the sense of like with Cersei the sense of like hmm you know actually I think this is a really interesting point so you guys who are watching I want to leave this open to discussion in the comments below so you guys go down there and let us know what do you guys think of Cersei in particular do you stand with me more so in this argument do you stand with Mary Lou more so in this argument and why like I'm really curious to know what you guys think and where that comes from if it comes from translation or the original mythology or your own personal connections with the character because I think 
you know, the fact that these characters can be interpreted in so many different ways is such an, it's such an amazing thing. And it just shows how deep and how rooted these characters are in people. And the fact that they were written this way so long ago, to me is fascinating. So I would love for you guys to let us know in the comments below exactly what you guys think and who you agree with. If any, you can disagree with both of us. You can be like, both of you are wrong. This is what I think. So we're gonna leave that as like an open sort of discussion down there. Yeah, I would love to hear. And 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 going back, like honestly, I think as you, like Cersei is definitely one of those open end uh, characters where it's like it could be one or other. It could be like we're multifaceted beings. Like who really knows? Uh, these stories are. I feel I have a good feeling that we'll continue to see more of them. Okay, Mary Lou, I I would love to reply to that, but I'm just aware that we have been talking for an hour and 10 minutes, which is far too long of a time to take up from your day. Um, so thank you so much, like genuinely from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for being so open and honest and so forthcoming. Um, and yeah, it, it means the world to me that you decided to come on this channel in the first place, but then also that you have trusted me with having this conversation with you. So thank you so much. And obviously, Thank you guys for watching. I say this at the end of every single video. It does mean so much more than I can tell you guys that you guys watch until the end of these videos and that you guys engage with the content as a whole. Now, as I said at the start, you guys can find all of Mary Lou's links in the description below. So do not forget to check that out down there. And we'll be seeing you next time with more videos here on Moan Inc. So I'll see you guys then.